Well, 7 o'clock, glad you're here tonight and have another study of God's Word, midweek service. We're going to be in the book of Judges. We're going to be covering it the next uh, several weeks, go through it. A lot of good stuff in Judges to learn from and, and to uh, help us know more about the Word of God. We'll begin the Word of Prayer tonight. And uh, Lynn Pennington, could you lead some prayer, please? If you would be reading through the Bible and you go get to the book of Joshua and you read about Joshua and how the Israel goes into the uh, promised land and, and they're doing well. I mean, they're faithful to God. They're not taking on any of the uh, uh, traits of the other idolatrous nations around them. Everything's looking great. And then you come to the book of Judges. Joshua is dead and things begin to go downhill because they don't have a leader. Uh, they are now using high priests to go to God and speak to God, and, and they, they do not have a leader, and uh, things begin to go wrong for them. They do go into battle. They win some. They lose some. And uh, God gets tired of them, tired of their unfaithfulness. He'll send in the enemy. The enemy will take them, and then God will send a judge in, and a judge will come and and deliver them. And that's how God operates here in the book of Judges. And the book of Judges covers around 450 years. And these judges, they come from the different tribes. you got the 12 tribes, and, and these judges will come from different ones that God will appoint and cause them to go into the enemy and, and take care of the enemy. And, and there are a lot of these judges maybe we never heard of and some that we are very familiar with. And the first two chapters... Uh, they cover a period of time when they didn't have any judges. That's where the first two chapters go to. So uh, in chapter 3 on, we find the judges coming into play, trying to bring the people back. Now in Acts 13 and verse 19, it is here the writer speaks about the period of the judges. When they had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After, he had, after that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. So they go into the promised land. Joshua divides the land up to each tribe. And, and that's a period of 450 years that the judges have to deal uh, with, the, uh, with the individuals. Now chapter 1 and verse 1, the judges... Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites, to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. So even though God gave them these, this land and divided it up, there's still an enemy in the land. So they're going to have to go and take care of the enemy, drive them out, wipe them out. That's what God wanted them to do. And who's going to be the first one? Well, it's going to be Judah. Judah's going to be the first one to go into battle and begin to take on the enemy. Well, in verse 3, so Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me to my allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. So Judah, nothing wrong with this. I want you to go with me, he says to Simeon. Go with me, let's, let's go into battle together. So that they agree. So they're going to go in and begin to take on the enemy. In verse 5 and 6, And they found Adani Bezek, 
and Bezek and fought against him and they defeated the Canaanites and the Parasites and Adonai Bezek fled and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. So Adonai Bezek is the, the king here in well, they catch him, and they, they cripple him up. If you cut somebody's thumb off, they can't use a bow. They can't use much of anything really to grip with. And you cut the big toes off, they can't do much either when it comes to balance or trying to run or, you know, anything of nature that requires balance. So that they treat him in a pretty rough way. Cut the thumbs and the toes off. But there might be another reason why they did this to him. It's because that's what he did, this Adani Bezek, what he did when he captured these kings of these other nations. In verse 7, Adani Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table, as I have done. So God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. So these kings would treat the other kings pretty rough. Once they conquer them, cut the big toes off, the thumbs off, bring them there, as he said here, to his house, under his table, gather scraps, just a, a very uh, low, low place there in the, in the king's household. So that's what the kings would do. And now... Uh, this Adani Bezek here, he finds himself doing the same thing that he did to others, and, uh, and there he died. So we've got to remember, uh, we reap what we sow. He, he sowed some pretty rough stuff here, yet it came back to him. And we can see that from what happened to this king here. The rest of the chapter, chapter 1, it talks about the other tribes going to war and they had some success and there's sometimes they didn't have success. But they would conquer the enemy and sometimes they wouldn't conquer the enemy. Uh, so that's the rest of chapter 1. In chapter 2, in verse 1 and 2, Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgag to Bochum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? So God was going to keep his promise. And he did. He, he carried them to the promised land. And they had a part in this as well. Don't make a covenant with these enemies, these other tribes. Not tribes, but these idolatrous people. Don't do that. You tear down their altars. But uh, Israel didn't do this. Oh, well, they did a little bit. But they uh, began to make covenants with them. They began to worship in the, in, with them and bring their gods, their ways of worship into the, into the worship that God had given them to do. And God didn't like it. In verses 3 and 4, Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. And so it was, when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and wept. I'm not sure exactly how many years have passed. No more than 40, as we'll see later, but it didn't take them long from Joshua's death to begin to bring in these other gods and, and worship us as they did. And he told them here, uh, these nations that you have not destroyed, they're going to be a thorn in your flesh. They're going to be the ones I'm going to use to punish you with. Your very enemy, you're going to be punished by them. And it made them sad for this to happen. They didn't do what God said. And if they had, if Israel had done what God said here, driven out the enemy, destroyed them, 
there wouldn't be all this turmoil going on in the Middle East today. So we're still reaping the, I guess, the rewards of what Israel did not do. And Israel as a nation, they wouldn't have had the problems that they had today over there with all these folks trying to wipe them out with, you know, with Iran and Syria and all these enemies that they have. If they had just taken care of business like God said for them to do here in Judges, but they didn't do it. And it's still with them today. <clears throat> then verse 10, chapter 2. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. So Joshua dies. Here comes this new generation. They were pretty good, but they didn't do everything that God said. When they died out, that's when things really went downhill. Because they didn't follow God at all. So one generation. It only took one generation here for the people to depart from God. And and we've heard it said many times, I'm sure, you know, the church is only one generation away from apostasy. Well, again, that would be true. If, a, if individuals do not speak the truth or stand for the truth, teach the truth, well, then you've got one generation away. It's all you have from the church not really existing, not, not being respected by God, that is. Of course, they'll never be destroyed. But from overall, there may be times when uh, the church doesn't stand for what it should be. It's not that. It's not the pillar and ground of the truth as the Lord wanted it to be. In verse 11, 12, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods among the gods of the people who were around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. 13. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers and who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so they could no longer stand before their enemies. So here's that second generation or the first generation that left the Lord they began to worship these idols and things of the enemy. And the Lord sent the enemy in, and the enemy took everything they had, took it away from them. They became slaves to the enemies. And they couldn't stand. They were too weak. All this because they didn't follow God in the way they should. So here they are. They once were a free country, had their freedom, but now they're under control of the enemy. And what do they do? Verse 16 and 17. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with the other gods and, and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which the fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord they did not do so. So when God did send the judges in, the judges did deliver them. They got them out of this captivity for a period of time, but the people never really repented of this. And you think they would have. You think they would have learned their lesson. We're not going to go that way. I don't want to be a, in the enemy's land. I don't want to be a servant to the enemy. So what, we're going to do right. But they didn't do right. They didn't learn a lesson. So nevertheless there, even though they were unfaithful, God's going to deliver them time after time after time. And also time after time, they're going to go back to the enemy. Verse 21 and 22, chapter 2. I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died, so that through them I may test Israel whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. 
So God's not going to help them in a, in a sense. He's not going to drive them out, the enemy. He's going to deliver them, but the enemy is still going to be there. And the enemy is going to be used to test Israel as will they be faithful? <clears throat> will they repent? If not, then God's going to punish them. And we've got to remember there's a difference in God tempting someone and God testing someone because God will never tempt. He will not do that. Not with evil, but he will test us. And here he, this was a test to Israel. Here's the enemy. What are you going to do? Are you going to follow or are you going to get rid of them? But they, as we know, they didn't. They did not get rid of them. So there's chapters 1 and 2 leading up to, uh, to the judges as they're about to come in. And in chapter 3, they've been taken captive. And look what they do in verse 9. Chapter 3 and verse 9. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. Amtenel, the son of Kenzar, Caleb's younger brother. So Amtenel here, he is the first judge that God sends to them. And he's Caleb's uh, Antonel would be uh, uh, get it right here. Antonel he's the nephew of Caleb the nephew. As we'll see he's also Caleb's son-in-law as well. So in, chap in Judges, chapter 1 and verse 13, is where we, we didn't read that verse, but, uh, but, but here it is, chapters 12 and verses 12 and 13. Then Caleb said, whoever attacks a Kirath sepher and takes it, to him I will give my daughter Ashas as wife. Then Antanel, the son of Kinzar, Caleb's younger brother, took it and he gave him his daughter, Achas, his wife. So Caleb made a deal. He will go and help destroy this enemy. Antanel says he will. Antanel will be his, Caleb's nephew. And because he did what he said he would do, Caleb gave him his daughter, which made him his son-in-law. So there's a connection between Caleb and the first judge. And then in verse 10 and 11, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, this would be Anthanael, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan, whatever that name is, the king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan. So the land had rest for 40 years, but not now the son of Kenzar died. So they cried out, they're in captivity, they cry out, they're under the reign of the Mesopotamians. They cry out to uh, God, God sends Anthanael. Nathanael delivers them, gets them out of trouble, brings them back home. And then he dies. This good judge dies. And everything's going well for 40 years. A new generation. That's what you have. 40 years, you have the generation turn over. And here's what they do in verse 12 through 15, uh, 14. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Amnon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. So they go evil again, sinful. God says, oh, let the king of Moab come in and take you. Here's your enemy. He didn't drive him out. He's coming in. He's going to take hold of you. 
plunder everything you got, take you as servants, you'll be a servant slave to them. And this lasted for 18 years. Then in verse 15, you'll see a pattern of this all through Judges. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. So here we have the second judge, Ehud, the second one, from the tribe of Benjamin. Let's see how well you remember. When we were going through the scriptures here a couple months ago, we talked about uh, just pulling out certain scriptures. What does left-handed man mean? (laughs) Born and just being left-handed. It means he is ambidextrous. That's a big word. He can use both left or right hand equal. Either one. And very few people can do that. There are a few that can. But when you see left-handed, that means that these, this man was a, was a great warrior. He could, he could have a sword in each hand. He could shoot a bow either way, with an arrow in either way. And uh, here's the second judge that God calls up. And he's going to, he's going to be going to do some business here on this king, Eglon. Verse 16 to 17. Here's how he delivers Israel. Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length and fastened it under the clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. So Ehud just wanted to pay respect to this good king. How we appreciate trying to get on his good side. So he goes in. He's got this knife strapped to his leg. Verse 19. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were in Gilgag and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. He said, keep silent. And all who attended him went out from him. So as he was leaving, Ehud is, the prophet, and then he says to the king, I got a message. This message is from God. And uh, Ehud, I want to hear it. Everybody get out. Keep silent. Come here. So they go out. And the door's locked. Two people in the room, Ehud and, and, and Moab here. Verse 20 and 21. And Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message for, from God to, for you. So he rose from his seat. Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. 22 and 23. Even the hilt, we call it the handle, went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. And Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. Pretty rough way to go. Very fat man. See how well you were listening. How long was the dagger? We were told how long. One one cubic, about 18 inches. You take 18 inches and go in here, stomach, come on up. That's a pretty good good distance there. You're going to do some damage. So the old king here has a... Severe case of indigestion. Got a dagger in him. Well, he, he, he gets out. He's got to go. Verse 24 and 25. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look. To their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he, probably, he is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. 
So they waited till there was, they were embarrassed. And still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took the key and opened them. And there was their master falling dead on the floor. He's dead. Guts everywhere. Blood everywhere. He's dead. They didn't check on him the way they should have. 26 and 27, but Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Sierra, Sierra. And it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim. The children of Israel went down with him from the mountains and he led them. They fixed him to go into battle. Again, that's what these judges would do. They got the people ready. 28 29. Then he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies to the Moabs into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab, and they did not allow anyone to cross over. At that time, they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor, not a man escaped. Verse 30, so Moab was subdued the day under the hand of Israel, that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So here we have uh, Ehud there that does what the Lord warned him to do. He delivers Israel from the enemy again, first of all, by taking out their king. He took out the leadership. And took him out. But he may not have done it by himself. There was another, there was another judge involved here. And if you notice there in verse 30, they had rest for 80 years. One generation learned something. They pass it to the next generation. So a long period of time here, a good time of peace. They were, they were free. So in verse 31, it says, After him, Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, he also delivered Israel. We're not told much about Shamgar. He was a, uh, a, uh, a judge, and it may be that him and Ehud uh, served at the same time as being judges. As Ehud went after the uh, Moabites, and Shamgar here went, went after the Philistines, uh, that's possible. Or it may be that Shemgar was the third one. Either way, God used him, used this ox goad, a piece of iron about eight foot in length. One end was sharp, and the other end had a spade on the end for digging or whatever. But uh, he took out some Philistines, 600 of them. He got rid of them. So there's how the book is going to go. And as we go more into the book, we get to these judges, we'll learn more about the judges, uh, more about them and, and the little details that help us to, maybe some little details we forgot about them. But it's a very, very good book, very interesting book. And we see the, here we've got three of them. And how one of them, at least, Ehud, went about taking out the king with a dagger, and another one went about taking out these enemy with an ox goad. Anything on judges, these kings, uh, kings, judges. All right, we'll take up next week in chapter 4. That's where we'll be. And we'll take on another, another judge, see what they did.